Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship today. We are so glad that you are here. And uh, we just pray that this worship service is a blessing to you. And also, of course, to, uh, I guess, uh, honoring and praiseworthy to God. So let's, let's start with a, a scripture here. This is one that is in your bulletin. And you may notice that every once in a while we put uh, different scriptures in there. But this one is from Psalm 100, verses 1 and 2. And it says, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Amen. Let's sing. This morning, we thank you and praise you for your uh, wonderful provisions. We thank you that you are Lord, and we just uh, lay this service at your feet. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to uh, join me in time of confession. Well, sound confession, then we'll uh, have a general confession together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you. Many times we think we're very strong and that we can do things on our own. But Lord God, we need you. And you tell us that we need you. So Lord, bring to our attention this time the very things which we need to confess before you. Jesus' name. Almighty God, before you all hearts are opened, all desires known, and no secrets are hid. 
cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. I acknowledge and confess that I am by nature sinful, and I have omitted doing good, and have done evil in thought, word, and deed. I have offended you, my God and Savior, and desire your forgiveness and mercy. I repent of all my sins, in Jesus' name, and for his sake. Amen. And this scripture from Psalm 86, verse 5. You are forgiving and good, O Lord, abounding in love to all who call to you. Amen. <clears throat> Our first reading today is Exodus 19, verses 2 through 8. And that's Exodus 19, verses 2 through 8. After they set out... After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is where you are to stay, say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together. We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. Our second reading is from Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 15. And that's Romans 5, 6 through 15. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. I invite you to stand. Let's profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. You'll find that on the bullets on the back of the songs. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated.
Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, very much for these tithes, these gifts, these offerings, truly signs of your amazing love to us. And we pray, Lord, that you will use them to your glory, that you'll use them to bring salvation to many. And also, Lord, that you would encourage those in need. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our resurrected Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, we want to say a thank you to those people who uh, run this place, the uh, Abercrombie Community Center. We're just very thankful that they have allowed us opportunity to worship here. And I, I see on the sign that it says that they're not doing any of our activities right now, but we get to. And so we're very thankful for that. And we pray uh, God's blessings and protection upon you, too. Also, um, I don't know when things are going to be done over at uh, the church in terms of the remodeling, but we're getting closer. Every day gets closer, and that gets more exciting. And then, and then we'll get to, get to do some cleaning, I think. And we're going to really need all hands on deck for that baby, because it's really dirty in there. So just a heads up, keep your schedules a little bit open if you can, especially towards that first part of, of July there. Any other announcements? No? All right. How about prayer requests? Any prayer requests? Praise the Lord for the rain too, I guess. Yep. Better have just for our nation. All right. Yeah. And you know what, part of the, yeah, I won't go into it too much. I'll just say, but our nation needs God. Yeah. That would solve a lot of problems. A lot of problems. All right. What else? Other prayer requests? One foot. All right. You've had some good news this week, right? Yep. Yep, that then it keeps getting the, the wound keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So that's really good. One point three centimeters by one centimeter. All right. Good news. Other prayer requests. For my brother for his travels. Huh? My brother for his travels. And where is he going? He's coming up here. Robert is coming up here. Oh, he's Sorry. coming up. Yes. Leaving tomorrow. All right. Robert's coming up. Yeah. Other prayer requests? I'd say thanks for the rain. Okay. Yeah. Great. I got that. Very good. Yeah. What else? Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you knowing that you are such an amazing God. You far exceed our expectations. And Heavenly Father, we pray that we would see even more the things which you do around us. That you would open up our eyes and our ears and our hearts to your plan. Lord God, we thank you for your word and we thank you for uh, your action in our life. We pray for those who don't see your action or see you involved in your life or may think you're far, far away, if even not, not existent. Lord, we pray that those people will be able to see, that they will spend time in your word and coming to you, even though they may not know you, but they will come to know you. Lord, we lift up our nation because our nation has many problems. It's made up of people, but also it seems fewer and fewer Christians Lord God, we pray that you will bring about a revival 
because we know that things like racism and theft and murder and all kinds of things like that are all sins. There are things that come out of our fallen sinful human nature. And so, Lord God, we pray that you will bring revival to people's hearts, bring them to repentance, because they will one day stand before a holy and mighty God. And we pray, Lord, that they will be able to have Christ on their lips and in their hearts before that. Thank you, Lord God. And we pray for new believers in our church, in our neighborhoods, and also in our state and our nation. Lord, we thank you for rain that has fallen, and we thank you for that, and we pray that the crops and gardens will grow. Lord, you are the source of life, the source of water welling up. And we pray, Lord, that you would just um, create in us thankful hearts always for the blessings you give us each day, things we take so easily for granted. Help us to give you praise and thanks for. Lord, we thank you for Vern's foot, that it's improving and healing. And Lord, we pray for even more. We thank you that we can bring these things before you. And we thank you, God, in advance for its complete healing. Thank you, God. Lord, we lift up Robert, too. We pray for safe travels for him from New Mexico and just uh, keep him, use him along the way and bless his time here, too. Lord, we pray your blessings upon the renovation going on at Bethany. We pray, Lord, that you will just bless all those who are doing the work. And all, we just pray it will be done in a timely manner. And we pray for those products to arrive here soon so that uh, things can be completed. And Lord, we pray for that time when we get to clean together, that you will help us to have great numbers, God, so that much, many workers will make light work. We thank you, Heavenly Father. We also ask you, God, to send out workers into your harvest field. We pray for people to attend the Free Lutheran Bible College and the Free Lutheran, Bible, uh, the Free Lutheran Seminary, that you would bless them, God. We pray for more and more people to become equipped in your word. And we pray also for those going into other areas, uh, thinking of people, students and gra recent graduates, that they'll be working this summer and those going to other schools or other jobs. Just bless them too, God. Help them to see you're using them in those places where they go. All these things, God, we give into your hands, and we thank you for your amazing love to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Let's sing How Firm a Foundation. It's on your insert there. children to come up for a children's message? I think we got a couple of you here maybe, huh, right? 
Come on up, come on up. Come on. Come on, come on, come on up. You don't have to, come on. Sit so this, just do that spine too. Have a seat right here. All right. Well, I want to just see how strong you might be today. You feeling pretty strong? Do you have some muscles? You have like muscles in your fingers, right? <laughs> yeah, me too. Oh. Well, sometimes we have to carry things. Do you ever have to carry anything heavy? Not much, huh? You don't have to carry around anything on your back, like a big backpack? Nope. I don't either. Not very often. My backpacks are light and they're little, and they don't hold much in them. My wife, though, this is her backpack, or at least she's had backpacks just like this. She got it for our daughter to carry books around in. <laughs> Some of those books are ridiculously heavy. You know that? They're so heavy that I don't know why people carry them around. My son had a backpack, something like this, and he carried books and books and books and books around, and then uh, it started ripping. And I'm going, uh oh, you know, that's not good. But sometimes we carry heavy stuff around. Sometimes we have to carry our own, you carry your own body around, don't you? You walk around, right? You carry your body. You have your feet in, right? And you do most of the work. And sometimes we carry other things like, maybe you have to carry out the garbage. You don't have to do that dance. Yeah. Well, does mom dance? Dad does that, something like that? Doesn't matter. I carry the garbage out sometimes. And sometimes recyclables too. But this is something I wanted to share. Ooh, look at this. It's so packed full that I couldn't zip it all the way. What do you think's in there? Books? Something I wanted to put in there and make it really, really, really heavy. <laughs> in fact, I'm going to carry most of it, but I want you to see if you can lift it up. Should we try that? Let's try it. It's so heavy, it's crazy. All right, stand up. All right. I want you to hold on, right? You, you, here, you lift there, okay? Okay, see if you can pick it up. <laughs> I was, is it heavy? Yeah. <laughs> it's super heavy. In fact, I, I can hardly pick it up myself like this. I don't even think I could put it on my back. It's so heavy. Do you want to put it on your back? Probably not. Okay. <laughs> oh, listen to this, listen. <laughs> what do you think's in there? A brick. It's a brick, a mason brick, yeah. What do you call bees? I don't know, they're pretty heavy. Look at that. That's what's in there. It's so heavy. Well, I want to talk about things that, you know, I want to talk about a Bible verse here from Romans. And this is from Romans chapter 5. We already heard it, but I'm going to read it again. And it's Romans chapter 5. Verse 8, and this is what the Bible verse says. It says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We, in other words, we couldn't carry the load. It was too heavy for us. So, when, so it's like we were weak and we were sinners, yet Jesus knew that. God knew that. That's why he came to us. The pack was too heavy for us to carry. Ridiculously heavy. In fact, it was impossible for us to carry. That's why he came. You know what he did? He went, when he went to the cross, many people say, uh, and the Bible says it too, that he took our sins upon himself. So he took our heavy weight of sin upon himself on the cross so that we wouldn't have to carry it anymore. This is, you can call this, this is like sin in our life. It's so heavy and makes it really hard for us to live and to do anything, you know? But God helps us. So, God, who created the world and all that exists, is able to carry all of our burdens. Isn't that cool? Including, well, I don't know about backpacks. He can help us do that too, I suppose, if we had to. But he definitely carries our sins and takes them far, far from us. So we don't have to have any more. I think it's pretty wonderful. What should we pray? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, so much that you carry our sins, that you take away our sins. 
they're so heavy and they weigh us, God, and we're so thankful that you take care of them and take them far, far away from us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming up, Allison. Right. I'm going to move this. Want to help me move it? You carry that right there and I'll take this part, right? Just move it this way. Back up. <laughs> Keep lifting it. Are you lifting it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Let's put it over there. Thank you. Appreciate it. The gospel lesson is from Matthew chapter 9. I invite you to stand. We're reading in Matthew chapter 9, beginning at verse 35. It starts out like this. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Chapter 10. He called the twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus. Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, preach the message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received. Freely give. Do not take along any gold or silver or copper in your belts. Take no bag for the journey or extra tunic or sandals or a staff. For the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search for some worthy person there and stay at his house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that home or town. I tell you the truth, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to the local councils and flog you in their synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Amen. The Gospel of our Lord. Let me see. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for your word. And we pray that you would bless us as we ponder it and talk about it even more in this time. We pray, Lord, that you would just have it sink deep into us so that it will overflow by your spirit in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have you ever been called a weakling? I certainly haven't. No. <laughs> Have you ever been called a weakling? I mean, seriously. Yeah? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's not a very nice term. It's kind of derogatory. It's negative, you know, to say that uh, he's such a weakling, you know. I can see someone saying maybe weak, you know, oh, they're kind of weak, you know. But a weakling is really kind of like trying to get them, you know. They're a weakling. Well, weaklings are not looked up to, and they're not admired in our society that I'm aware of. 
Now, babies, they're a little cute. They're cute and beautiful, and they're small, and they're very weak and dependent. But I don't know many who would call them a weakling. It's kind of interesting. Physically, men like to be considered strong, right? I mean, I don't know a man who wouldn't want to be called, well, my husband's strong, you know, or something like that. They like to hear that, well, thanks, honey, it's no big deal. <laughs> but seriously, who doesn't want to be considered strong? Maybe even having big muscles, though I'm just strong, but you know, well, maybe not even that sometimes. Yeah, I, I, I think of my mother-in-law and, and her sister who were with us for a little while, and they had admired us, my wife and I, getting off the floor. <laughs> you know? so they're just like maybe 25 years old or something like that, a little bit more. I'm thinking, oh boy, I should be thankful for the strength that I have now. But I'm sure that most women don't want to be called weak either, right? I mean, we all like to, strong is the, is the thing. You want to be strong. Like, especially when a person's grieving, they want to be considered strong. You know, even though they might know that they're weak, but they want to be considered strong. They may have to be strong for other people, too. I'm pretty sure that we could come up with lots of examples in our life when we felt like a weakling, felt like we were not strong. I'm pretty sure, though, we could also come up with uh, some things in the Bible about when like who, who was this considered the strongest person in the Bible? Samson. Samson. Boom. Comes right to our mind. Who is considered the weakest? Well, it's like Samson comes right to my mind. We're kind of geared that way. And they're the ones who are lifted up. Of course, there's a neat verse with, uh, in Judges. You could read about Samson in Judges 13 to 16. But there's a neat verse in Judges 16 that says... Uh, when Delilah, of course, was trying to find out his secret of strength, Samson answered her, If anyone ties me with seven fresh bowstrings, which was not true, he was telling her a lie, uh, that have not been dried, I'll become as weak as any other man. So, in, in his eyes, every other man was weak. <laughs> you know? I'm not sure if you know who is the strongest in all of history. You can look up who's the strongest man in all the world, you know, today. You won't hear about Samson. This doesn't pop up first on Google. But you hear about some other people, someone who held a world uh, record for seven years. In the end, he gets sick and he dies. That's how that works. Well, of course, God is the strongest when you think about it. God's the strongest because... He's made everything that exists. He is like all powerful, and that's pretty amazing. And because of that, God's the strongest, right? You can find uh, some things that God says about strength and weakness in the Old Testament. But before I get to that, and just thinking about that, and thinking about our society, think about uh, what's the uh, one rule or guide of uh, evolution? It's about... Uh, the strongest and the weakest. Can you think about what that is? What's the one of the things that they say regarding evolution? What? Survival of the fittest. The strongest. Best equipped. Not the weak. The weak dies and is out of the gene pool. That's what people believe about evolution, but God doesn't believe that. He doesn't believe in evolution. He, he created everything. And there's lots of evidence that are all around us. And if you ever want to talk about that, I'd love to visit with you, especially if someone wants to email me or whatever. Love to visit. It's a good topic to talk about. Did you know that God shows favor to the weak? He shows favor to the weak. I mean, how contrary is that to the world? God showing favor to the weak. The theme is found in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we first hear about it in the Old Testament, of course, because that's first. But here's one verse from Psalm 72, verse 13. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. That is really contrary to the way of the world. Because in our fallen world, people are cruel to those who are weak. People are, will oppress. I mean, boy, if, we, if, if they got rid of all the police stations in the United States, we'd have a very serious problem. 
very serious. There would be anarchy. People doing whatever they want because people are sinful at the core and they're wicked. And because of that, they'll do whatever they want and take power they can. They take advantage. But God not only takes pity on the weak, that's only one verse. I, yeah, you can talk all kinds of verses about widows and orphans, uh, people who are, who are poor, that God favors them because they need protection from everybody else. God not only takes pity on the weak, God also believes that uh, this is how people should live. Live like him. Psalm 82 verse 3 says this, Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. He's telling people to do what he does. To have pity on them. To have compassion on them. On the fatherless and the weak and the widow, the poor. Many times God says to uphold the cause of the widow, the orphan, and the poor. And then this kind of is an intro that brings us to uh, our lessons for today. Especially Romans chapter 5. And thinking of this from verse 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Did you notice that? For while we were still weak, people didn't have to become strong. They didn't have to become better people. They didn't have to become good people. He came to us because we couldn't go to him. He is the one who is strong. He comes to the weak. While we were still weak, the right time Christ died for the ungodly. He died for us. He, all people. God showed his love for us in that way. And then in Romans 5, verse 8, two verses later, it says, but demonst he demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's another way of saying that verse 6, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. People didn't have to clean up. You didn't have to get, uh, go out and do this many prayers. You didn't have to read the Bible 50 times or one time. You didn't have to do all these things so that you would be ready, better. Not at all. We're weak. That's why he came for us. And then that we are then jump over to Matthew chapter 10. And all throughout chapter 10, it's kind of fun because uh, if you just think of it, looking at through the lens of uh, weakness, look what Jesus does. You know, this creator of all the world, what's he end up doing? He ends up giving his disciples who are weak and unable to do these things. He gives them authority to do things that they couldn't do before. He gives them authority because Jesus has the authority. And he tells them in the very first verses of chapter 10, he says, uh, he called his disciples. So notice the two, that he called them. And then it says that he gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and, and to heal every disease and sickness. When God calls us to do something, he gives us the authority to do it. He equips us to do it. So if you encounter something really difficult and you like to think God calls you to do this particular thing, trust me, he will provide for you to do it. And then we have the apostles all listed, all men from different backgrounds and all Jewish, but they are uh, certainly common people. None of these were religious leaders. They're all just common people. So in the religious leaders' eyes, they'd be considered Weak, you know, at least according to some of the Pharisees and Sadducees that we had on that day. And then these, these, these 12 apostles, first of all, they're called disciples. And then another verse later, they're called apostles. They're sent out. That's in 1 and 2. But in verse 5, these 12, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. And get this. Think about the theme of weakness again. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritan. Rather, go to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, preach the message. The kingdom of heaven is near. And then he tells them to heal the sick. It tells them to raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, and drive out demons. I wonder if they're thinking in their head, Ooh, 
are the other going, yeah, that sounds exciting because it's probably the way they had it because later on, they come back all excited that they'd done this. <coughs> but the emphasis, he says, is don't rejoice that you did these things, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So anyway, going on, then he says to them, uh, freely you have received, freely give. Do you know that song? Freely, freely you have received, freely, freely give. That is uh, based on this, I'm sure. You know, what a great verse because whatever we are able to do in Jesus, whatever we are able to do is all gift from God. There is no such thing as a self-made person because it all comes as a gift from God. The strength to do it, the opportunities, the uh, resources, whatever it might be, especially when we're thinking about the kingdom of God and working for him and, and witnessing, he makes it possible. So freely you have received, freely give. And I wonder, what did they receive? Are they, what are they thinking when he says that? Is it just before when it says, heal the sick, raise it, did some of these things happen to them? But then we have the next verses too. Do not take along any gold or silver or copper in your belts. Don't take along any money as you go out and do these things. It's like, whoa, they're going to be weak. Well, no. They've been given authority by Jesus to go out and do these amazing things. Certainly, God's going to provide for them too. We're called to do amazing things too by God. Yeah, you'd be surprised. We really are. I don't know what they all are. Some of these maybe. Other things, forgiving somebody, that's truly a God thing. We're called to do amazing things. We're called to go, though, and to trust him. These disciples had to trust for their provision. We trust God provides for us too, right? I mean, there's lots of churches, I think, that have been greatly affected by this COVID-19 pandemic. And some of them may close. Very unfortunate, very tragic, like a lot of businesses. People maybe didn't send in their tithes or gifts or offerings or whatever it might be. Don't know. We were affected too, but thankfully we don't have to close, you know. <laughs> Take no bag for the journey or extra tunic or sandals or a staff for the worker is worth his keep. We are all workers for his kingdom. And God does call us to do various things. And you think, I don't know what God's calling me to do. Ask him. Think general to begin with. Keep it as a prayer request and just ask him, God, what do you want me to do? You may feel weak. That's okay. Because you are. <laughs> You're a bunch of weaklings in a way. Not weak in the faith, but weak in other ways where we think, hey, I can't do this. And maybe we're poor in the faith. That might be another say weak. We're weak in the faith too. We need Jesus. We can't do it apart from his authority. With apart from his resources, he will equip us because he calls and he equips. He would not do it otherwise. He'd have to equip. You can talk about many more things in here. And he talks about going into a home. And it's, you know, if you find a place where there's peace in that home, let your peace rest on it, but stay there. Don't jump from house to house looking for something better. You know, look for that worthy person. Jesus says that you are to be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Get that. When you see a snake, what's one of the first things you want to do? What? Kill it? Chop it up? Get rid of it? Chuck it far from you? Hurt it? Whatever? Yeah? Poor snakes. <laughs> I remember mowing and shooting. Them. What was that? <laughs> Poor snake. I, didn't, I wouldn't worry about it. I was glad it's gone. But, you know, guard snakes, if you go to the guard, you can go on like this. But the whole point is, if you're as shrewd as snakes, snakes have to be uh, kind of clever to keep hidden, in a sense, if they thought that way, you know. Christians, in our society today especially, and globally, are typically attacked. They're the most persecuted group that there is, more than Jews, because there's more Christians. It's really a tragic thing, but we need to be shrewd. We need to be clever. We need to be creative so that we will be able to survive and share the message. But also, we're to be innocent as doves. 
Or there's another verse, I think another translation says, where to be as harmless as doves. So when you're being creative and everything like this, you're not going to be trying to get back at the people who are maybe hurting you. You know what I'm saying? We're to let revenge belong to the Lord and it does not belong to man. Weakness. Being a weakling. Not honored in our society, but it is honored and protected by God. Because they need it. In God's way of doing things, really those who acknowledge that they are weak, they'll be blessed. If we admit that we need God's help, we will be blessed. If we admit that we fall short of what God expects, he'll bless us. He'll take care of us. You know, pride is when we say we're not weak. I don't need God. There is no God. That's pride. But being humble is very close to weakness. It's essential to see that we are indeed weak. Because you think about that verse from Romans 5 again, you know, in Romans 6. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. It demonstrates his own for, love for us in this while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I, I, I see the weakness. I see the sinning as being uh, similar, joined, whatever. I think about that verse, too, about uh, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples. And he said to them, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We're weak. We are weak in will. We are weak in obedience. We are weak because we're sinners. But in Christ, we can be strong in Him. That's the big difference. We can be strong in Jesus because He gives us that strength. He gives us that faith. He gives us that trust. I guess what I want you to do is to realize, you know, to, for us just to be honest that we're weak. And for most of us, it's not going to be very hard to think that, you know, we need God. That's why we're here. It's part of the reason why we're here, you know. But along with that, think about those disciples who were sent out. They were sent, sent out with authority. And when they're sent out with authority, there's a purpose for that. And God had called them to do certain things. We live here in this area, you know, and this is our, our life is in this area. We're living in this area. Are there neighbors next to you that you do not know? Are there people uh, down the road that you've been feeling nice, like, oh, I really got to connect with that person. I, I got to connect with them. But ah, I'll do it later. Don't put those things off. You know, just follow the Lord's lead and just make that connection. You know, we need to do more of that. I, I, I was thinking the other day, you know, I, I get so wrapped up with, with my family or my, with my grandkids or doing whatever. It, it's so easy to be completely, you know, nothing, don't know what's going on around me in terms of neighbors or anything like that. We've got to be more alert to that. I do. And that's one area where I'm weak at that I've got to think beyond just my family or just my immediate friends or whatever to go beyond that. Um, by, grace, by grace through faith in Jesus that's how we can be strong that's where the true strength lies in faith in Jesus because then great things will be accomplished more than we can even imagine let's pray Lord God we thank you for your calling those disciples those apostles and we thank you Lord God for calling us too Lord many times we are weak Many times we have blown it, you know, but we know that uh, when we are weak, you are strong, as Paul said in Romans. Lord, we pray that we will be reminded to continually trust you, God, and to ask you, what is it that you want us to do? 
We may be weak, God, but you're strong, and you are the one with authority who sends out. Use us in this congregation, God. Use anyone who might be listening today. We pray that you will use us to your glory and to your praise, and that we will not use the excuse that we're weak, but we will use the excuse that you are the one who calls and equips, and you will help us to do whatever we need to do, because you have the strength. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll sing Because He Lives. Because He Lives. On your insert. <laughs> you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>